Yes, appreciate it, uh, the invitation to be here today. And Steve, it's a pleasure to have a chance to chat with you. Um, Farmer recently launched Go Boldly. Uh, I've seen it on TV already. Uh, what is the goal of the campaign and why now? Well, I'm relatively new to pharma. I started a little over a year ago, and I've made a, re a real point of uh, getting out into the field. I've taken something like 60 trips since I took the job in November of 2015 and toured the labs and met with a lot of the leaders of the companies, but also the, the researchers in the labs. And I've been blown away uh, by a couple things. One, the advances in the science, a lot of which has been discussed already this morning, um, really things that would have been referred to as science fiction just a few years ago, harnessing the body's own immune system, personalized therapies, CAR T, we're actually taking cells out of the human body, modifying them and reintroducing them on smart bomb missions, just incredible stuff. But the second thing that really came across for me um, is in every one of those interactions, a researcher or scientist uh, or an employee of a company, if I was doing a, a town hall meeting, would come to me and say, why aren't we doing a better job telling our story? Mm -hmm. You know, that they're really dismayed that there's this yawning gap mm -hmm. between the public perception uh, and the work that they're doing in the labs. So what Go Boldly is all about is really a couple things. One is to get people excited about the science again, uh, but also to bring together stakeholders like we're doing today to really explore policy changes that need to be made at the FDA to ensure that we're expediting patient access as well as looking at innovative payment models. You know, we understand that the payment uh, models need to evolve, that we have to have systems in place that are every bit as innovative as the drugs themselves. So those are the two principal aims of Go Boldly. Mm -hmm. I can tell you as a journalist in this city for 30 years and a journalist of almost 40 years, that it is fast, especially in this city, this city in particular. So in addition to the campaign though, mm -hmm. Go Boldly, uh, leaders in your industry, including yourself, met with President Trump and senior members of the administration. Can you tell us what was discussed during the meeting, and uh, is there any common ground? I think there is. It was, it was a very uh, positive, productive exchange. I can tell you the president is, is focused in a couple of areas. Uh, one is on ensuring that you know, we lead the world in the development of better treatments and cures. Um, and he's very focused on policy changes that would ensure that we continue to lead the world. Um, so we explored things like stronger trade agreements so that we level the playing field with other countries and that we're focused on supporting the uh, IP investments that our companies make. Tax reform, uh, which we think would, would in improve and enhance our company's ability to continue to invest in the U.S. Other regulatory changes that could take place um, that would, again, uh, spur investment. So I, I think it was a very constructive exchange. There was a lot of common ground. The other thing the president's focused on is innovation. I think he understands that we're entering this, um, you know, we're on the cusp of a golden era in medicine and that we want to harness a lot of what's been discussed this morning and make sure that we realize that promise. Um, so I thought on, on balance it was a very good discussion. So beyond, beyond these uh, specific areas of, of common ground, um, what other policy areas are you focused on and what do we need to address to see positive change for the patient? One of the things I've been trying to bring to pharma is a real, um, you know, bring pharma into the solution space. Uh, we think there are targeted uh, consumer oriented pragmatic changes, um, you know, that can address healthcare costs holistically. So there's a set of changes. You know, if you, if you look at the uh, media coverage really in the last year, there's been several instances um, of so-called bad actors that have dominated the coverage. And the common denominator in the case of Turing or Valiant or Myelin has been uh, off-patent older medicines uh, where there's a lack of competition, in the, prim primarily in the generic space. So it may seem odd for the branded industry to talk about reform of the generic um, approval process, but we need to have targeted changes that address those, those issues. So clearing the backlog at FDA, uh, creating tax or manufacturing incentives, other incentives to encourage uh, generic entry. A lot of the reforms that have been talked about already in the, in the context of the 21st Century Cures Initiative, our own user fee agreement with the agency, things like modernizing the clinical trial enterprise, better use of real-world evidence. We think there are concrete steps 
uh, that can make the FDA process more efficient. And then on the reimbursement side, you know, really the second uh, pillar of the Go Boldly effort is, is uh, what we're referring to as the value collaborative, where we want to bring stakeholders together, payers, providers, um, and others to explore different payment models. You know, we need to move away from one drug, one price, to, to engaging with payers uh, at a more granular level and, and better aligning uh, the value of the product with the reimbursement and the outcome achieved by the patient. And so we think there are policy obstacles that need to be addressed in moving in that direction. I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. Our companies are, are precluded today from engaging with payers before a product is approved. Or even if, if a company has data, say subpopulation analysis that indicates uh, that their product reduces hospital readmissions, that can also run afoul of FDA uh, law and regulation. Uh, the IG, the Office of Inspector General, has guidance that was written in 1999 that says if you had to have an adherence program, and we know that adherence programs are absolutely critical when patients actually take their medicine, they get better outcomes. The IG has, has ruled that that's an inducement to use the product which may have made sense in 1999 in a fee-for-service world, but we're no longer living in that world. Right. So my point is, there are targeted uh, pragmatic reforms that can move us away from paying for volume to paying for value. This next area, uh, personally, is fascinating. Innovation, genomics, our ability to understand the causes of disease at the molecular level. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've now led to medicines which can fight diseases right at the root, even enlist ways for the immune system to fight the disease. Mm -hmm. How do we continue to spur innovation into the future like that? Well, we've learned a lot about uh, those, those um, innovations this morning, and uh, it really is an exciting time uh, in the science. And, and maybe I'll just, a quick departure, I have a personal connection mm. as well. My son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, two years ago when he was 10 years old. Uh, it's, you know, I, I've spent my career in the life sciences and felt like I had an understanding of of chronic disease and the implications, but until you're really living with somebody that's coping with uh, living with a chronic disease, you really don't get it. And um, you know, as I look at what's happening in the in the research around type one, I think about the the advances that we're talking about in, in cancer and other areas. So, you know, I think about um, you know, Chris, my son is you know, we give him four or five shots a day, checks his blood, pricks his finger four or five times a day. It's an, it's a very challenging. Uh, disease, particularly for kids at a time when they should be carefree. Uh, but some of the exciting advances on the horizon, I think, have every uh, you know, opportunity to really change not only the day-to-day, -day, but eventually, hopefully, a cure. So you think about things like oral insulin, so you wouldn't have to do injections, or smart insulin, where insulin would be inert in the body for a period of time and the body would use it uh, as it needed uh, to, to device drug combinations where we'll have smaller uh, pump technology. So, so I, I think that we're, you know, you talk about autoimmune disorders, you know, in the cancer space, you're trying to stimulate the immune system. In, in my son's case, uh, type one is where the immune system overreacts and kills the beta cells in the pancreas. Um, so, so it's a very exciting time uh, in the science and we wanna make sure through this effort that we're uh, really identifying the policies that need to be need to take place. You know, I think this cluster is so impressive right. in Boston. Talk uh, about that. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's it's the, the highest performing, if not the uh, highest performing cluster in the country. Uh, and it really brings together this this incredible ecosystem that's necessary to produce uh, breakthroughs in the science. But I want to make a point, which is that the, the ecosystem is fragile. You know, I spent the last 16 years before I came to pharma in the medical technology space, which is also very robust here in Boston. And when I first joined AdvaMed, um, we had a, a meeting uh, associated with JP Morgan with the venture community, those uh, venture uh, investors that were focused on um, early stage uh, companies, Series A financings. And we would have a room of about 20 or 30 investors. In my last year at AdvaMed, 10 years later uh, as CEO, we had to cancel the lunch. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was really only a handful of uh, investors that had the stomach for investing in, in early stage device companies. And there was a lot of factors involved there. But the reality is investors can invest in any sector. 
um, especially those without the friction or uncertainty associated with regulatory approval or whether payers will, will adopt or embrace a breakthrough technology. So my overall point is we have the secret sauce right. in this country uh, of bringing together investors, academia, private companies to really advance the science, and that's really em emblematic of this this cluster, but it's fragile. We absolutely have to have the right set of public policies uh, to continue to do that. Well, in television, that's a wrap. 10 minutes Thank you, Steve. goes quick. Thank appreciate you for sharing your ideas Enjoyed this it. morning. Thank you very much.